Our next speaker is uh, Yusuf Chaha. Mr. Yusuf Jaha is a doctoral candidate in Islamic theology at the University of Nottingham, whose research focuses on the interplay between Islamic spirituality and transpersonal psychology. He is attorney mufti and translator at the General Authority of Islamic Affairs and Endowments in Abu Dhabi. Jaha is also an author of numerous Everybody is listening, right? <laughs> Chaha is also the author of numerous articles on Islamic economics, Islamic spirituality, psychology, and ecology, many of which have been compiled in his forthcoming book, The Way of Return, Responding to Economic and Environmental Justices Through the Wisdom Teaching of Islam. Mr. Yusuf Chaha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير I'm tempted to pause for the adhan to finish that's going to eat into my time though <laughs> and uh, um, one of Imam Malik's um, Fatwas is that if you're involved in ta'aleem, involved in knowledge, you can continue speaking while the adhan is going, and you can repeat it afterwards. You can repeat the for the fadail, for the benefit of the um, getting the reward of repeating what the ma'adhan says. So uh, my topic is intersections between transpersonal psychology and an Islamic model of consciousness based on a classical text from the Islamic tradition. I'd first like to thank the International uh, Association of Islamic Psychology, my friend Abdullah Rothman and Professor Malik Badri for inviting me here. It's quite a topic, especially in half an hour, um, and so I'm going to push straight ahead. Um, there's actually three elements to this, and uh, Dr. Rania um, touched upon some of the things I was hoping to touch upon, which is the need of sanad, the need of a uh, consistency of connection in our tradition, especially when we're trying to Islamicize something. And while she touched upon many texts, um, it's also important for us to note that when we are doing this in Islamic psychology, then we actually have a continuity of tradition, which is known as tasawwuf, or tazkiyatun nafs. Hence we forget that uh, ilmun nafs, which is the psychology of treating the nafs, has a continuity in our tradition, and this is embodied by the uh, science of Sufism uh, with its various branches, its various formats of institutionalization, and its cortex. So I'll first start by defining uh, the, his, the historicity or the trajectory uh, that um, is relevant to my talk, and that is to do with the, the context of what is the problem of consciousness. Um, as Muslims today, we don't exist in a vacuum. We are uh, subject to the trajectories of modernity. And modernity, uh, by its dominant paradigms, is defining our institutions, starting from our educational institutions. So consciousness itself remains, as currently defined, the great mystery of human existence. In a contemporary world dominated by a materialistic paradigm, the question of how an animate consciousness, the sense that I exist, seemingly is existent in a background of inanimate matter, is a vexing problem. This is what was dubbed the hard problem of consciousness. And it was called so by someone called David Chalmers, who introduced the term and specifically called it the hard problem, because he said we can often define functions of our consciousness and we can define it in very physically reductionist ways. But we can never define what it means to be in the subjective experience of those functions. What does it mean to see? Who is the seer? Even if you take the theories of sight and you take the theories of hearing, where is the one who's seeing? These are the mysteries of existence. And so it's that subjective experience of conscious phenomena, what it is like to be in them, that sense of me that makes this problem, and they, led, they call this problem also the mind-body problem, 
intractable, unable to be solved. And the reason why it's called the mind-body problem is thanks to someone called René Descartes, who with his famous phrase, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, was credited as being one of the first people to introduce this distinction. That, namely, as he said in his philosophy, that it's the disembodied thinking mind that gives rise to the sense of consciousness. And that the body, and by the body he means everything outside that can be perceived, was something separate and in his opinion of ultimate irrelevance. He famously said, accordingly this I, and he would call that a soul, the soul by which I am what I am is entirely distinct from the body and indeed is easier to know than the body and would not fail to be whatever it is even if the body did not exist. Now the nature of this paradigm is that it's set into play a trajectory and it's important for us to note trajectories because the very state of division that it introduces between the mind and the body led, went in parallel with a philosophy of mechanistic science which was introducing the same division at the level of God. God, even though believed by most of the proponents of the major scientific revolution, was relegated to a watchmaker, the deistic God, the God that's out there, the God who somehow has created matter, but now is no longer involved because it's operating on its own terms. And accordingly, as the trajectory went into play, man could then assume that he can become the master and controller of the universe as long as he understands these rules that play. And as this trajectory went further and further, as the philosopher David Bentley Hart notes, reason abhors a dualism. It doesn't accept two. It doesn't accept a multiplicity when something can be made one. And instead of the making of one, which we call Tawheed, by the way, Tawheed is literally translated as the making of one. It's a verbal noun. The ability to see a multiplicity, the ability to be aware of a multiplicity, but to see oneness in that. Instead of the Tawheed of Allah, it became the Tawheed of nothingness, matter apparently existing by itself. And so what happened was, if... if Descartes posited that the only thing that's really of soul and spirit is somehow in the body, in the brain. He literally said the pineal gland and everything else is machine-like. Then a point came when philosophers such as Daniel Dennett, taking their lead from earlier philosophers such as Le Mate, who said man himself is a machine. Daniel Dennett would go on to say that this Cartesian self itself doesn't make any self. It doesn't make any sense. It's Cartesian theater. And the sense of I am, which was later called the ghost in the machine, was then defined as epiphenomenon. It just so happens to come into existence by the biological patterns of the machine. And so what this does is turns the entire state of the sense of divinity, the sense that we exist, the mystery of existence into its head. As one commentator calls this, divinity reduced to dopamine. And as the new atheist Sam Harris says, when we can do away with all this spirituality. The function of a maturing neuroscience is to now map, somehow take the brain and map all the physiological processes that occur. And this will somehow reveal the greater mystery of what it means to be. As you can sense, this, this philosophy denies the one claim that has been made by mankind in this history. And the claim by all mystics that God is the ground. God is the source of all consciousness. God is what gives birth to being itself. And God is the one who has true being. In favor of an assertion that inert matter is all that there is. A claim that two philosophies are now challenging, or two trajectories are now challenging. One of them being quantum mechanics itself, which is taking science further, and another being transpersonal psychology. So now I'm going to move towards areas such as transpersonal psychology, which in essence is the case for the soul within psychology. In informal terms, transpersonal psychology could be termed the subfield or school of psychology that studies the spiritual side of our experience. 
Transpersonal is a, is a word that integrates the spiritual and transcendent aspects of human experience within the framework of modern psychology. Much of its origins can be traced back to the earliest of the pioneering figures of psychology, such as William James. William James was an American philosopher and psychologist credited to be the first educator to offer a psychology course in the United States. And his landmark book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, posited what he called something called radical empiricism. Radical empiricism, which to him was basically uh, taking empiricism to its natural cause, which was knowledge, to, to be able to derive knowledge from sensorial experience, shouldn't be relegated to just an exterior experience of just behaviorism, which is how most psychology started evolving under the positivist framework, but should be naturally go towards an interior set of experience as well, which was introspection or phenomenology, to study the nature of what it is to be, to go inside and to be willing to feel. Another major pioneer amongst the early exponents of what could be called transpersonal psychology was Abraham Maslow, as most of you will know. And Abraham Maslow's whole hierarchy of needs were right at the top. He posits self-actualization as the ultimate goal of if, if we follow all of our hierarchies of what it is we really want was famously understood by him as a way to transcend the individualistic self altogether. And in fact, Abraham Maslow, alongside other people in 1969, was amongst the people, alongside someone called Stanislav Grof and Anthony Sutich, was amongst the people to found the first publication of the first journal of transpersonal psychology. And what they saw was that these states themselves have healing experiences. In other words, the higher you can transcend and the higher you can become, what they used to call human potential, the greater your healing would be. So the journey of realization is actually a journey of healing. And most people who try and undertake that initial journey of healing gradually end up taking that journey of realization. Just out of interest, one of the first founders of, of transpersonal psychology in an educational space in America was someone called Robert Frazier, who actually is a Muslim. But I want to move on as to how this emerging field, or not so much emerging, but now uh, quite uh, a lot of discourse on this field, has now challenging this dimension of the consciousness being relegated to matter. In the 70s and 80s, a figure known as Ken Wilber comes onto the scene, and he writes a lot about transpersonal psychology, and we find some of that academic discourse filtering into the more populist space of a kind of ecological environmental consciousness. And one of the things he does, alongside various other collaborators, such as Daniel Goldman and others, is to pioneer a series of works which literally start studying consciousness, studying meditative states, to bring about the study that people like, uh, as we mentioned, William James spoke about, that interior empiricism, that how can we rejoin that with that science? And there were some very interesting publications. Amongst them was Daniel Goldman's The Meditative Mind, The Varieties of Meditative Experience. And there was also a, a, what to, uh, Ken Wilber was the, the gold standard, which was produced by someone called Daniel P. Brown, who was a Harvard associate professor of psychology. And he produced a work which is called uh, Transformations of Consciousness, The Stages of Meditation in Cross-Cultural Perspective, whereby he sat down and he looked at the dominant texts that speak about consciousness in the Buddhist tradition, in the Hindu tradition, in the Eastern Orthodox Christian tradition. And then he sat down with people who'd meditated with these traditions for 15, 20 years. And he did a textual analysis. And he said that in a cross-cultural sense, which means across these supposedly different religions, there is an equivalence. And he brought down what he called six stages. And what those stages were was there's a beginning of change at the level of, of, of core beliefs, at the level of behaviors, and then there's a moving beyond an egoic identity into resting in the energies, being able to feel the body at a deeper level. And then a state comes when then, through most of these traditions have vocal practices, some of them have breath work, but a stage comes when the individualized identity drops and there is a oneness. 
a oneness felt with the world, a oneness felt with the oneness that's bringing about all things. And then he says there's another stage usually beyond that, wherein that oneness of dissolution now enters into a maturity and it comes back into the world. And then these same people are learning to live what it means to live in this world of supposed multiplicity from a position of oneness. Now it's very interesting he said this, and he didn't study any of the Islamic texts. The question that I wanted to pose, and I'm posing here, is what is our interaction going to be in the context of Islamic psychology from this transpersonal perspective? Given that for millennia, Muslim scholars have spoken about what they consider the sayr, the spiritual journeying to Allah. And they consider this an implicit and explicit reason as to what Islam is all about. The Quran asks us, فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where are you headed? It's not a question just relegated to Islamic psychologists. It's a question to everyone who opens the Quran. And the, re the way that's answered by scholars, it's not a journey, it's not a question that's to do with a physical sense of direction. It's to do with, with your tawajjuh, your intent. Where is it that you have made yourself orientated towards? And this is why Muslim scholars and people of Tasawwuf have posited that the intent, this journeying, is nothing but the journeying of La ilaha illallah. Because La ilaha illallah, as Imam Ghazali and others took, is an ontological imperative. فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Know from every aspect of your being, La ilaha illa Allah. Which means first there has to be a negation of otherness. And all otherness arises out of the otherness of oneself. The understanding that I am separate. The understanding that I exist through myself. And that otherness that comes from me then causes me to grab on objects of my perception. That maybe I can be through this, maybe I can be through this. Which is why most of us need to understand that what is it we're asked to negate before we can say La ilaha illallah are those areas that we grab onto which is why the word ilah is often understood as wala, that which you give your being to. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran contrasts that. He says, La tad'u ma'allahi ilahan akhir. Don't call upon any other ilah apart from Allah. La ilaha illa hu kullu shay'in halik illa wajha. There is no ilah apart from him because everything is perishing apart from his countenance. In other words, if you want true being, then stop grabbing at other than Allah. Because you're already through him. So the question then becomes, have our Muslim scholars spoken about these states of consciousness? And they have. There are different varieties by which they've spoken about them. Some of them have spoken about them from the position of wujud itself, maratib al-wujud. And these could be found in the books of Abdul Karim al-Jili and Jami and others. And others have spoken it from the position in, in an aphoristic style, such as in the Fa'il al-Iskandari, and others have commentated on these aphorisms. And others have spoken about it from a position of linearity, such as Imam Ghazali in Minhaj al Abidin. And others have spoken about it in the position of what they call the soul's journeying. And this is what's known as Maratib al Nafs. And the book I'm hoping to touch upon is a book that's been translated. It's called The Degrees of the Soul. I chose this book for this presentation because it's been translated into English, it's relatively succinct. It was translated by an Islamic psychologist, Dr. Mustafa Badawi. And you can see that even in a small book like this, you have a, an outline of a transpersonal dimension of the soul. So the first thing we need to understand is, is this something we can actually speak about? Is this something traditionally that Muslim scholars should speak about? And on this topic, a famous scholar by the name of Ibn Ajiba who writes in his book Al-Futuhat Al-Ilahiyya Fil Mabahith Al-Asliya, his commentary on another book called Mabahith Al-Asliya, he says the placing of this essential secret of who man is. It's referred to a secret in the sense that it's an open secret. You need to discover it for yourself. Uh, has been single, is not permissible to put into writing in an openly discursive manner. This is because the likelihood of openly discursive expressions uh, uh, as soon as they are articulated, likely to not be understood. For it would be seen either as commonplace and laid bare, or it may cause a, a sort of confusion. So he says, while this is the case, 
He says, so while we don't speak about it in an openly discursive manner, we don't speak about it fi wajh tasrih we don't speak about it in an openly discursive way, we speak about it through metaphorical illusion, ishara. And he said, why does ishara work? Why does metaphor work? And some of you I know are familiar with the work of someone called David Grove, who speaks about the power of the metaphor to elicit implicit understandings in the psyche. And by the way, psyche is another word for the soul. The implicit understanding is because according to Islam, at some level, all of our souls do know this. Ibn Ajiba in another quote says that all of us on the Yawm al-Mithaq, which is what's known as the Yawm al-Lastu bi-Rabbikum, when God supposedly revealed himself to all the souls, and all the souls responded by saying, Qalu bala shahidna, we have witnessed, is that on that day, the Rububiya, which is often translated as lordship, but really means, if you look at the earliest of Dictionaries such as Raghab al-Asfahani, it means that which is raising you from stage to stage to stage, ila halat al-tamkeen, to a position of perfection. And what was the perfection? It was all of these names that were being revealed, multifaceted names that were being imprinted, and Ibn Ajiba uses the word, muntabi'atun. It was imprinted upon that soul. And that's why that Quranic verse says, this imprint is on your soul, specifically so that you cannot say, I was upon this ghafilin, I didn't know. And so the reason why metaphors work, if there is readiness, is that it is already speaking to a resonance of knowledge. Which is why all knowledge of this type we call dhikr. The Quran says it's a dhikra, dhikr. And dhikr is recognition. It is literally to realign yourself with that which you already know. So how does this fit into a psychological framework? Well, for starters, this is the understanding of the fitrah. And one of the things we need to develop if we're looking at an Islamic psychology is how to align fitrah within developmental psychology. The famous prophetic hadith, Kullu mawludin yulid ala fitrah, every human being is born upon fitrah, and then it says different communities change it, isn't a lambast or an accusation against other communities. It's a role, it's appointed to the role of socialization in taking us out of this unicity, taking us out of this awareness. And that's why the author of this work, Abdul Khaliq Shabrawi, starts his book with a prologue on what the fitra is. And he starts his book with a prologue on what ran, rust on the heart is. His allusion to the word rust is a sense of forgetfulness of that element, of that connection, of that witnessing. And, for, and just as Ran is a, is a powerful metaphor, rust, no matter how thick it gets, if you were to be given something that underneath it is valuable, you wouldn't debase the entire thing. But depending on the degree of the rust, you might need to do more work. And the object of rust is to prevent light. It prevents the light from coming. And one of the things Abdul Khaliq Shabrawi says is that so it is with the heart. That when this black dot or rust comes, it makes it lost to its own reality. And when it gets lost to its own reality, in that outward perception of the world, it can only jump onto an object that it thinks can fill that darkness. But as long as it's an object that is subject to the temporality of that world, it's caught in that cycle of jumping and grabbing. The primal desires of khawf or raja, fear and hope, being attached to that which is temporal. And so he says the only way out of it is to come and rest in where that true reality is arising from. And this actually is very interesting because we'll find in the works of psychologists, developmental psychologists such as Michael uh, Washburn, who speaks about the role of how children, when they're born, they exist in a dynamic ground of unitary consciousness. Or other developmental psychologists such as Harry Hunt, who basically mentions that children are likewise in that state, but they project that onto the primary caregiver, the mother. And the mother is the one who's meant to embody all of that unicity. But as soon as the trauma results, which is inevitable because the projection can never be met by the mother, then the child falls back into that state of alienation, which leads to an individuation, which leads to a state of separation. This is also represented in the works of Margaret, Margaret Mailer. And this can find strong resonance with the works of John Bowlby and his attachment theory, or Carl Jung and his pros what he speaks about individuation, or object relations theory as detailed by Melanie Klein. 
What this means is for us in our spiritual understanding of these things, we to see fitra as a ground for hope. That every single one of us has already got this imprinted in our souls. And this becomes a ground of respect and love for every single human being because of what is in them. Imam Shafi used to famously say, You think you are a lump of flesh, but in you is the entire universe. And that's why the Quranic paradigm of the signs of the horizons and the signs in yourself, that means everything you see outside and everything you see in yourself is mutually complementary. Everything you see outside, if taken to its level of ma'ani and one of the roles of light, is meaning that's finally drawn from that, is resonant and ready present in you. And everything of that is in the Qur'an. And so when we understand this, then we understand that the very first level that the soul speaks about is a nafs amaratum bisu. The soul that commands to evil is actually part of human trajectory. That individuation, that sense of I, is a part of being in this world. And that's one of the things that Abdul Khalik, Sheikh Abdul Khalik al-Shabrawi speaks about, that everyone sort of starts, unless you're exceptional, from this base level. And that base level is to think, I exist by myself, as the Qur'an posits, Kalla inna linsana layataga, arra'ahustagna. Man has gone astray, he's gone beyond all boundaries. If the primal state was to see God, then the primal delusion is to think, Istagna, I am by myself. And when you think you're by yourself, then your whole motives and aspirations revolve around that self. And that self, according to Islam, is a false construct. As Ibn Ta'ala says, that individuated self is a false construct. Nothing has veiled you except the delusion that you are by yourself. And nothing can stop you. This whole journey of La ilaha illallah is that journey of individuation that I am by myself to that journey of being with Allah. And so when he says the first stage of moving out of this, it's very interesting. He says the first stage of being able to move out of this selfishness is to learn, move even ever so slightly away from the primal desires of khawf and raja, fear and hope, which are just twin pillars of attachment. That's why Allah says, I will test you with fear and avidness because it's just attachment. And a decrease in wealth and prestige and my fruits because those attachments often become the aghiyah, the replacements to God. But to just move from that primal desire of fear and khawf into qabd and bast, a willingness to just feel. This is amazing. Abdul Khalid Shabrawi is detailing a psychological change to just, can you feel? Can you just feel the energies of qabd and bast? And the awareness opening up. And as you move from that, he details, as most of us will know, I'm not going to recite the Quranic ayah, nafs al Allah swears by the nafs al because it's now praiseworthy. And why is it praiseworthy? He starts giving a practice at this point. He says, you should involve yourself with Allah. That's his practice because he was shadili. He says, make much recitation of the name because the name will burn away the otherness in your heart. And as you start doing this, he says, a side of you will emerge which can start condemning that amaratum bisu, that individuation. Now, we don't accept this as being the Freudian superego because Freud would consider that to be the guilty complex of the father. Rather, we say this is the true self emerging in the background of the false self. And as he moves from this, then he says, one of the stages comes is tahqiqul irada. He now realizes, what does it mean to be on this path? What does it really mean to be Muslim? What's the point of Islam? Quran says, فَأَيْنَ تَلْهَبُونَ He realizes the answer is deeper than a surface level. It is to kill that false self. To die the death before you die. And to live the life of truth. And as he enters into this, then he commits himself to a behavioral change. He makes tawbah, tahqiqut tawbah which is the realization to turn back to Allah. And then he commits himself to a behavioral change, and then he enters into the nafs al-mulhama, which is inspired. Now at this point, according to Sheikh Abdul Khalik Shabrawi, I know I'm really short of time. What's the time? Three minutes left? Yeah. So he, he's in need of a guide. 
Because as he's now mulhama, he's getting things are opening up in his consciousness. And he's being aware now of various things. Now, according to Sheikh Shabrawi, there is the role of the mulk, which is pure form. But as his consciousness is expanding, he's entering in what's known as the malakut, which is a spiritual angelic realm. And he's seeing meanings. He's what, what he calls alam al-mithal. There are meanings behind forms, and he's perceiving them in his wakefulness. Now at this point, discernment is not established for him. He's not able to rest in a way or criterion of knowing what is right and what is wrong. And this is why the role of a guide is needed. And this is why most of the format of the Sawf has always involved an institution of tariqah. These are reasons for these institutions. And the reason for having a guide is because the premise is the guide has already traversed the terrain. And so he's able to educate you about the pitfalls he's had. And as he con continues on this thing, then he commits himself to six things. He says, dhikr, fikr, reflection. He starts opposing the egoic self, hunger, night vigils, and often given to silence and seclusion until he enters, just two more minutes, the nafs al mutmainna. He moves from there to nafs al mutmainna. And now his journey is with God. And at this point, Shah Abdul Khalik says, we could collapse this. Many people just say nafs al mutmainna. Others expand this because they see there are intricate stages within this. The nafs al radia, nafs al madhiya, nafs al kamila. But his essential point is, fana happens. I'm not going to speak about what it is. I mean, that would imply no anything about this. But he, he gets dissolved. And that itself is a temporal stage. And there are degrees of fana he speaks about, but then he comes back to God, baqiyon, and I'll end here. This is what he defines as true humility. True humility is to look back at yourself and realize there's nothing to be humble about because you don't own anything. And he also says that this is what real being a khilafa means. We, we sometimes politicize these terms. Khilafa literally means to follow that which is before you. And to Allah says khilafa tunfil ard in this world of form. And so these names that were present with God are meant to be perfected in ourselves and we are through him and we are by him. And the ending of this role is constant. It's the way of constant contemplation. One of the things the scholars speak about, Ibn Ta'ala will end here. In his aphorisms, he covers this whole spirituality and he ends with an aphorism of fikr, constant contemplation. The journey of those who reach God never ends at a point where they say, we've arrived because that journey is constant. It's a constant un un journeying. And so their fikr, their contemplation is not, as he says, the fikr of the people of Dalil wal Burhan. This leads to that, this leads to this, this leads to that. It's the fikr of those of shuhud wal ayan, those of witnessing. And so they enter into this heart state to constantly be in that divine presence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that ability. I'm sorry if it wasn't that academic, but inshallah. Thank you.